Episode 42. Uh, a, I am a woman. B, I'm a minority. C, I was a veteran. And those are all added attributes to being in the small business arena supporting federal government because of the set-asides. And again, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always had a hustle. I've always been busy doing something other than a nine to five job. I don't know what that is to have a nine to five job and just go home. I, I, I don't even understand that mindset. Welcome to the GovCon Giants podcast, federal contracting for people on the outside looking in. If you are here to learn how to win a piece of the pie without getting your face smashed in, then you've tuned in to the right place. Now, the giant that not only walks the walk, but talks the talk, your host, Eric Coffey. Before we start the podcast, I want to make a request for anyone out there who's a developer or a programmer, or if you know anyone out there who works in blockchain, AI, AR, VR, or has a solution that they think can solve a problem with an agency, let us know. The venture capital arm of GovCon Giants is proposing solutions to help support the warfighter, and we want to partner with you to do so. This may be your shot at presenting your new technology to the world. Now, on today's podcast. For anyone who's on the fence about federal contracting, for anyone who may be in doubt as to how it can fundamentally change their business, or for those persons who are looking at substantial wealth transfer, this is the interview to hear. Our next guest, Lori Sales, is the owner of Civility Management Solutions, a multi-million dollar professional consulting firm that she founded back in 2012 after the firm she worked for started downsizing leading up to their 8A expiration. Lori was raised on the streets of Chicago and at age 21 joined the U.S. Marine Corps. Upon departing the Marine Corps, she found herself, like many veterans, unable to find employment and not knowing how to seek out work after leaving the military. So she took a job as a receptionist and worked her way up to project manager, eventually believing that she was an ideal candidate for federal contractor because she was a woman, a minority, and a veteran, which are all added attributes, as she tells it, to being a federal contractor as they are set aside. When she finally made the switch from seeking out employment to setting it off on her own, it wasn't an easy one forcing her to take odd assignments and projects to build up past performance for her company, even at one point doing task rabbit to bring in revenue for the business. But Lori kept persisting, always choosing to operate with high integrity and ethics. And when her company finally was awarded the 8A certification, she then was able to leverage all of her relationships into a tangible contract, being awarded her first two-year, $2 million sole source contract immediately following the receipt of her 8A. I must admit that I've listened to this interview multiple times. The jewels that she offers are so vast that I quickly publicized a few of them the day after we recorded this session. I can easily make a list of more than 15 key takeaways from this interview that would be invaluable to share with thousands of business owners out there looking to make their path. Please listen to the complete interview in its entirety because even at the end, she answers the questions of where we see contracts falling short. It is with the most highest regards that I bring you this episode, our next giant, Lori Sales. Today's guest on the GovCon Giants podcast, Lori Sales. Welcome, Lori. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Thank you. So glad much. to be here. Same here. I'm glad to have you here. Can you tell us your company name and a little bit about what you do? Uh, company name is Civility Management Solutions, and we provide professional consulting services to the federal government, uh, state, as well as local. And we're operating specifically in program project financial management and conference logistics. Okay, wow, that's a lot. When did you found Civility Management Solutions? Civility Management Solutions came about in August of 2012, after a couple of years of debating when, uh, but that was the timing that I flipped the switch. Okay, okay. Before we get started uh, in depth into your company, I'd like to use everyone to learn a little bit about your background and kind of what got you to the place where you're at today. Can you tell us, I know um, when I was reading up on you, since you were born and raised in Chicago, Yes, that's correct. Okay, what was that like? That is like? my home. <laughs> that was fantastic. Actually, uh, uh, I, you know, when you grow up uh, uh, poor, you never can really know you're poor uh, when you're young. Uh, so I was in the projects of the city of Chicago. And uh, my parents, uh, I was blessed to have both of my parents. And my mother was the housewife. And my father had two jobs to provide for us. Uh, we were even in Catholic school. Wow. Uh, 
and uh, I guess there was some kind of voucher program going on even in the 60s uh, that allowed us to be at a Catholic school that we could walk to uh, not far from the project complexes that were nearby. Um, but I was fortunate to have uh, both of my parents in the home. So they were born like 1910 and 1921. So it was a very uh, traditional household, even though we were in the projects. It was like we had a house with a white picket fence outside because we sat down with my father to eat when he came home. Uh, we all had our chores. It was a very orderly lifestyle uh, growing up in, in the city. That's interesting to say that. Um, I have a similar experience myself. We grew up in a uh, predominantly you know, a poor community, but mm -hmm. we had our own doctor. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we saw the doctor all the time. We had our own dentist. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a family doctor. Right. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's interesting to think that back then it seems like uh, even though you didn't have a lot of money, you had other stuff. Like you said, you went to Catholic school. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, uh, Robert Smith from Vista Equity Partners. He said the same thing, that he had a bus that bust him to the school on oh, the other wow. side of town. And what he noticed was that the kids that took that bus were mm -hmm. more, uh, today, fast forward, right, um, later, they're the ones that have the most uh, opportunities or doing the best out of all the kids. Ah, so Maybe the Catholic school experience had something to do with it. Uh, well, it was a lot of disciplinary uh, movement going on there, more <laughs> so than educational, <laughs> to be totally honest with you. Because uh, actually, when I got into the public school system, I realized I was behind in one area. I didn't uh -huh. know the multiplication table. You know, and I'm thinking, and everybody was looking at me like, you don't know this. And I'm like, uh, no. Uh, so that was a, a learning curve that I had to jump into. And I love math in the end. So it turned out okay. <laughs> kind of, it, it, the transition worked out well. Uh, okay. Because it, by the age of 10, my parents had moved out of the uh, project complex. My mother, uh, realizing that her husband was a Vietnam, Vietnam a World War II veteran. And uh, she decided to go to the VA and uh, we were able to move forward in purchasing a home uh, in the uh, southern part of Chicago, a little further south. Um, that was actually through the VA loan. So I did get into a home with my family uh, that was being built in a neighborhood that we pretty much infiltrated because there we were <laughs> very few, very few blacks in that neighborhood at that time. Today it's a very black neighborhood, uh, but at that time it wasn't. So those was, there were some real challenges with that because of course the kids didn't want us there and they let us know that. The parents didn't want us there and they let us know that. But we got through that time. It just kind of strengthened me a little bit more uh, to say, you know, you got to fight for what you want. Right. Well, and it's interesting. I ask people who are entrepreneurs, was there something that they did in their childhood? Like, again, I sold candy in a bus. I sold flags. Was there something that you did yes. that, yeah, that kind of got you that entrepreneurial start? I've always been an entrepreneur. And so it's, it's great to hear you say that because, right, I still, I sold candy uh, out of my parents' home when we moved into the house. Before we moved into the house, I did the babysitting. My mother allowed me to go uh -huh. and babysit a lot of young ladies. When I think about it, you know, now as an adult, they were young and they had two or three kids or whatever. And sometimes it was just to allow them to go to the store and come back, you know. Um, so I've always had a means of making my own money as far back as I can remember. Um, and then when I went to high school, I, I modeled professionally in the city of Chicago, so Magnificent Mile, and I were uh, very connected. I did a lot of things at the McCormick Place. So I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit, um, and once I joined the Marine Corps is when pretty much all that stopped, because I was a Marine 100 percent of the time, and they made sure you knew that, <laughs> that your job was to be committed to being a United States Marine. So and then when I got out, then I kind of fell back into some other little ways of making money. And, and you know, in Chicago, we call it a hustle. I've uh -huh. always had a hustle right, other right, than right. the nine to five. Always right. have. Yeah. No, no, that's interesting. Um, you know, I find that connection with a lot of entrepreneurs that they had some mm -hmm. sort of hustle uh, throughout their life experiences. Now, what, why did you decide to go to the Marines? Oh, gosh, the story on that is really interesting, but I had um, gotten, uh, was encountering Navy guys because I worked at the train station where they would come in from Great Lakes, Illinois, for the weekend because they were about to graduate. And so they would come in and you see a sea of white hats and caps, and it only took one bold guy to come up to me, you know, and I was modeling at that time and working as 
the cashier on the weekends and in the evenings all along while I was a student in high school. And it just took one guy that was bold enough to would come up and say, you know, what are you doing when you get off work? You know, we like to hang out. We've never been to Chicago. We're, we're about to graduate from the Navy. I'm like, sure, sure, sure. So I became like a tour guide. Uh, and that continued for a couple of years. You know, guys would come up and just ask, what are you doing after work? And then I found uh -huh. myself taking them to the Sears Tower, the Navy Pier, uh -huh. singing their songs, you know, and marching with them. You know, so it was a lot of fun uh -huh. uh, returning them back to the train station. Then they'd be off and gone. However, that impacted my life, uh, especially because I didn't see college because I was already somebody that was making good money. My parents couldn't afford to send me to college. So I'm thinking maybe this military thing. So I talked to a couple of guys that I knew. They both happened to be Marines. I dated them independently at different times. They did not know each other. But <laughs> it, 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 interestingly, they both thought if I was going to join the military, that I should become a Marine. And at that time, I didn't even know women were in the Marine Corps. So it was very interesting. I'm like, they got women in the Marine Corps? Uh, so I actually joined, not ever seeing a woman in a Marine Corps uniform, but on the, on the TV screen that they kind of showed us right before we enlisted. Uh, but uh, it was an interesting introduction. But I trust these gentlemen enough to say, right. if you think I'll be a good Marine because you really know me as a person, right, then right. I'm going to take that option instead of the Navy. What does your family feel about that? How do they feel? Uh, that's a very good question as well, because um, they were happy about it. Uh, actually, when I joined the Marine Corps, okay. I did not inform anyone other than my immediate family. Uh, I was very street. You know, I said I've been an entrepreneur all my life, read between the lines, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, from, the, from the streets of Chicago. So I've been uh -huh. doing a lot of different things. But nonetheless, my, I, I wasn't happy about some things. And so I wanted to change. And so at the age of 21, uh, uh, I joined the Marine Corps. The decision was when I was 20, and only my parents and my brothers knew that I was going to join. Uh, and the word was to not tell anyone, and Lori just moved out because I was of an age. You know, I was getting, I was in that 21 range. Right, right, right. Because I was not confident that I was going to pull it off either. I mean, this was a different thing. It was a challenge. Most people knew me to be pretty headstrong and stubborn and, you know, a go getter. And, and it's like, Lori, nobody's going to be able to tell you what to do. Your parents don't even tell you what to do. Right. That was the attitude of my friends and I just stopped telling anyone about what my next steps were going to be and I came back a woman marine and everybody was like wow where have you been wow wow, wow. <laughs> that's, like, you that's really fantastic. don't want to know yeah <laughs> that's, that's yeah, fantastic. I, that's I fantastic. shocked a lot of people because remember I was modeling professionally for many years so how did oh, I go from modeling, modeling to being to marine? Be marine right no that's <laughs> true like, yeah Oh man, like, that's a stretch. <laughs> that's, no, that is that is a stretch. That is a stretch. So interesting. So you come back. So you were you were a model. Then you went to the Marines, and now you get out of the Marines, and then you do what when you come out of the Marines? I uh, get out of the Marine Corps, and I, I'm at uh, North Carolina. Cherry Point was my last duty station, and a friend of mine um, that I knew from Hawaii when I was stationed there. Uh, this was her home, the D.C. metropolitan area. She lived in Maryland. And she offered me the opportunity to come here and uh, look for work. And at that time, uh, a gentleman I was engaged to was from Baltimore. So this was like, okay, I, I can do that. So we would drive down here. He would go to Baltimore. I would hang out in the Maryland area seeking work. And I found headhunters. That was a big, big deal in that era. I'm not sure how much it is still today, but I know that headhunters pretty much ran the uh, uh, corporate America and nonprofit industry here for many, many years if you wanted a job. And uh, this was long before, you know, they had all the TAPS programs for, for people that's getting out of the military or internet, right. you know, to help people, you know, uh, be able to use a reference to uh, know what they were doing in military to now what they're uh, getting ready to do uh, as a civilian or what they qualify even to do as a civilian. And so that in itself was a challenge for me. Uh, my first job offer, was as a receptionist after getting out of the Marine Corps. And at that time, I was an E-5, uh, so I, I was a staff, in, I mean, an yeah, NCO. And you had I been was, in the Marines for 10 years, right? Uh, well, I gave them seven years active duty. And so okay. I had completed seven years of active duty. I'm used to, you know, leading people, managing things, um, uh, making stuff happen. But I didn't want to go be a police officer. I wanted to come out of uniform. I didn't want to be a correctional officer. I wanted to come out of uniform. I was determined to come out of a uniform. And those would have been very easy uh, transitions, obviously. But um, I chose to go into the business world. So receptions is where they started me. And I had to learn how to speak. Hello, good afternoon. 
my name is Lori. How can I help you? I mean, uh, so this is like, yeah, cause I got, as you hear my voice is pretty uh, uh, yeah. prominent in itself. Right. So I had to learn how to put some lilt Talk in my voice, wow. <laughs> which was quite, quite entertaining for me back then. And uh, four letter words was a wonderful way to communicate in the Marine Corps, right. uh, especially as a woman and happened to be African American woman, you know, in order for me to make sure that I was clear that I wasn't going to take no stuff. I mean, you know, my communication was <laughs> far from being much of a lilt. So <laughs> it was an interesting transition, but right. $17,000 they offered me. And at that time, all I knew is I was excited to be offered a job. Uh, That's all uh, I knew. Sure. And the HR guy even said to me, ma'am, um, are you sure you want to take this position at this money? And I'm like, yes, I do. Where do I sign? Had no idea that you can negotiate, uh, that you're expected uh, to negotiate right. because you don't negotiate anything in the United States Marine Corps. They tell you yeah. what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and for how long. So um, that was a part of the intro into the civilian life that was very challenging for me, just totally unaware of how to operate. Uh, on this side of the of the industry of, of having a job. We're going to talk about that later on and your advocacy work with the vet, with the VA. Mm, by all yeah. means. Yeah. Well, so you come out and you're a receptionist um, and then you do that for some time. And I then, did that for about a year. Then I became, a, back then they called them secretaries, which was my next bump up. And then after the secretary, I was an admin assistant. After an admin assistant, voila, I became an executive assistant. And as an executive assistant, you know, at least I was getting in the area of making, you know, somewhere between 40000 to $55,000 right. a year. And sure. um, I'm like, you know, feeling like, okay, well, I can, you know, afford to maybe independently live by myself and I don't need a roommate. And uh, right. so some of those things begin to happen. And, and mind it, I'm moving around. I'm not staying at any one job. I'm not even staying in one state. I treated my civilian career uh, when I first got out very much so like the military. I mean, you know. I just didn't relocate with jobs. I would relocate states. I relocated back home to Chicago. I relocated to Florida because I don't have children. So it allowed me that flexibility uh, to just up and move if I wanted to uh, and not being married. So I, I, I made a lot of moves, but yet I didn't have any increase financially, still trying to figure it out and not yet being uh, uh, with the college degree, uh, which also, of course, can be a, a hindrance uh, uh, because they could use that against you despite all the things I've done long before the civilian world ever got their hands on me from the military, none of that stuff was relevant at that time in my life. What did you, what, where is your job in the military? Uh, actually, maintenance management, which okay. was basically uh, working in the maintenance battalions where the mechanics, the technicians, the armor, um, all were housed uh, to make sure that all of the equipment that's necessary for the fighting Marine to go off and do what he do uh, was well maintained. You know, because let's be clear, I don't care how much they train, if the M16s are not popping them off, we're not getting nothing done. Right. If the trucks are not moving, you know, so uh, my job was to go around and ensure that we were 98% ready for war at all times. That was what we would like to have to report to the commanding officer every day. Um, and if it wasn't, then of course my job got a little tougher because now I'm, I'm over in the supply asking, why is this uh, a Jeep down? Why is this... Uh, um, the tents got holes in them. What's the issues? And of course, they'll tell me about what's missing. And a lot of times, amazingly, there was this very small, tiny piece of nomenclature that the whole tank would be just steel. I mean, no movement. We can't do anything to this little tiny piece of, of a screw. Right, comes right, in. comes in. Right, yeah, it used right. to amaze me. I'm like, really? That's what's keeping that big old machine down? So nonetheless, uh, that was my job, maintenance management was to ensure that we stayed ready at 98% and to uh, create the report to go up to the commanding officer on a daily basis. So you have this great responsibility in the military and then you come out and you can't find work. Yes, and, and not knowing how to seek out work based off of what I was doing because it was like a foreign language. You know, I don't recall when I stopped saying I have to go to the head. Mm. And that's the restroom. That's the bathroom. That's the ladies' room. That's a whole bunch of things I can say today. But at that time, I know it was over a year's period of time. Um, and there was a young lady that was kind enough to bring it to my attention. She said, when you say you're going to the head, are you saying you're going to the bathroom? I'm like, yeah. She said, well, why don't you just say that? Then I'm going to the bathroom. 
and and it hit me like a ton of bricks that you know whenever I was saying it, they they like looked at me probably when I walked away and giggled like she said she going to the <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like the, you know I got my, my little business suit on you know trying yeah. to make it in the corporate America world <laughs> so and you're telling me you're going to the head <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think I think there's some listeners that are going to be able to identify with you on that one <laughs> yeah so it was the, it, the transition was a lot more complicated and difficult. Uh, uh, at that time, again, because we didn't have the internet, we didn't have a means of learning what's going on in the world like they can. And now people can sit down and teach themselves many things just through YouTube. And I mean, it's just, it's amazing where we are today that can help simplify the process for the transition because it's challenging for every veteran uh, once they come into this world, uh, no matter uh, where they've served, whether it was during war or not, it doesn't matter. It's just a, a different culture. Now, finally, you get an opportunity to work um, at a higher level type position, mm -hmm. right? And is that where you start learning about government contracting? Well, actually, and it wasn't technical, but it was um, just uh, uh, management, uh, mm -hmm. which, you know, uh, I've, I've, I won't say I was a born leader, but if I look back over my life, I can say that I was um, um, pertaining to you know, just sitting with friends, everybody's trying to figure out, well, what do we want to do? We want to, you know, swing on the swings, or do we want to jump rope? Do we want to, you know, um, play Chinese rope? You know, Lori nice. was always the one that had the answer. And so people leaned in on me for that and, and depended on me for it. And it's just been who I've always been. However, the first contract that led me to understand the government contracting even existed, meaning, oh, everybody that works in the government is not a federal employee. That was like a duh, right. and, but I yeah. didn't know. I All thought right. that, and this was just maybe like 15 years ago uh, that I just found this out. And so my entire life I've gone on without knowing this. And I was hired to go in and manage an administrative contract with fire personnel that was supporting the National Cancer Institute. So it was very spectac spectacular work, uh, high level. Uh, you know, he was a president appointee. So this was just like a wow. And I'm thinking, this has been here all along. And uh, I got processed uh, to, to get a TS at that time uh, because the company really liked me a lot. And before that contract ended, amazingly, someone else contacts me with a problem that needs to be fixed on a contract that she has. And she sent me in basically as a mole to uh, try to fix the situation and so that her mod modification year, at that time I didn't even understand all that, uh, uh, her renewal year can be, you know, option year rather can be renewed and that happened and after that experience on the second now uh, government job working inside the department of transportation i now was asked by her to come into our corporate office and that's okay. when i really started getting my head wrapped around what this government contracting world was and that i was an ideal candidate for this area of entrepreneurship now what made you believe you're an ideal candidate uh a i am a woman B, I'm a minority. C, I was a veteran. And those are all added attributes to being in the small business arena supporting federal government because of the set-asides. And again, I've always been an entrepreneur. I've always had a hustle. I've always been busy doing something other than a nine-to-five job. I don't know what that is, to have a nine-to-five job and just go home. I, I, I don't even understand that mindset. Uh, then I went back to school. And I finished my, not finished, but yeah, finished because I had college credits, college credits when I arrived here in Maryland. But um, I finished here at the University of Maryland, uh, University College, which is now UMGC, which I love that school, by the way. Um, but my mindset began to change tr tremendously once I got to working in her office about this is exactly where I need to be because of one major point it's the wealth transfer. There you go. Yeah. Out of all the things I have been trying to do and doing, this is where the real money landed that allowed me to have impact and some power and some influence in my community in any aspect I choose to. And so that's one of my heart's desires still and one of the things that gets me up and go every day about this work that I'm involved in now. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Tell us now, you were working at the company and in the very beginning, mm -hmm. You said, I wasn't sure when I should make the transition to start my mm. own business. Mm -hmm. um, the fortunate thing was that her company was coming to a close on his 8A and uh, the 8A Small Business Administration Program. And um, she was needing to start looking at, you know, cutting back in her corporate office. 
And so I was fortunate to be one of the last program managers to get transitioned out. Um, however, um, I ended up getting the opportunity to go over to NASA. I was sent there for an admin assistant position, may I add, which again, I have the background from it, right? Now, I've gone from receptionist to secretary to admin assistant to executive assistant to office operations director to a, a, a PM, and now I'm being asked to go and interview for an admin in the position. But I was smart enough to know if I don't, I won't be able to get unemployment. But at the same time, civility had been established. So I'm thinking, okay, great. It's time for me to jump off the roof now and make this happen. Be totally committed to disability management solutions. Don't take on another job. Just, you know, roll out with, with this. And then they said, well, can you go over to NASA and do an admin assistant interview? And I'm like, oh, my God. Okay. Well, I did the interview. Uh, before I can get back to the office, they had contacted the uh, corporate office that I was working for and inquired about me coming in being a leadership development consultant. And I took on that position. Unfortunately, I uh, was not able to go over to 1099 under my company due to some leadership decisions on their part. Okay. But nonetheless, I had to accept that and move on. And I went over and successfully uh, uh, revamped the mentor protege program at NASA headquarters, which is still in place today. Wow. wow. So that was my ending to working for someone else who right. was, uh, was at NASA. Uh, and then after that contract ended, I, I did not go looking for any other employment and right. I committed myself completely to civility management solutions. The one thing, let me add this as a drop of information, a nugget. I, I choose to operate in integrity and in high ethics. I choose to. A lot of people in this business don't. However, initially when I thought I can just go ahead and move civility management solutions along and get certified as a woman owned small business, check the box. It's simple as that. Just check the box. The details behind checking that box was, do you work during normal business hours for your company? And while I was at NASA, the answer was no. So I actually held out from being certified even as a woman owned small business until that final um, job position ended. And uh, it makes me feel great that I practice that integrity very early in this uh, game yeah, uh, because I've been challenged quite a bit by people about how they do business and I refuse to do that. I'm like, no, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. So let's, let's not talk about that. What about that? <laughs> wow. No, that, that's interesting that you say that. Um, I, I've, that's the first time I'm hearing something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, but I, I always say people, how you do anything is how you do everything. So even when no one's looking at you, um, yes. how you feel inside. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Now you decide, okay, I'm not going to take a job. Well, okay. So how do you start getting contracts? Whew. This was one <laughs> of the challenges. I sat at my kitchen table for uh -huh. about four and a half years. Um, I paid myself minimum wage because I was smart enough to know I needed to. And I was out and about doing lots of training between PTAG, SCORE, events for women uh, uh, that they have a women veteran. Uh, I was participating in all these things to try to increase my learning into the space that I was in. And I was going to outreach sessions. And so I was very active during this time. I wasn't just sitting at home on the computer. I was in and out putting things on my schedule, you know, as a business owner, uh, just making no money, having no money. The first thing I did was attach myself to one of those entities where they can hire you online based on, you know, whether or not you can do administrative work, uh, whether you're going to come to their house and clean their house, whether you're going to come and organize their home. And I took on several ass assignments of that. Actually, TaskRabbit is the name of it. Oh. And yeah, and so th that allowed me to start having some revenue run through the company. Um, so that at least there was some momentum of some activity in the checking account. And I uh, had a situation of a bankruptcy. So I didn't want to pay somebody else's bills because I co-signed no way too many things uh, with an ex-husband and my attorney highly advised that I do a bankruptcy, even though I was misresponsible. But that allowed me to at least take my mortgage for a, a little while and uh, drop it into that account. So I was making deposits monthly into my business checking account. And then I was doing this activity on the side um, to get some activity of revenue going in and out. And then I turned around and um, got introduced into simplified acquisitions. 
And when I got introduced to Simplified Acquisitions, a um, gentleman by Guy Timberlake does an awesome job of that, may I add, of teaching uh, uh, individuals in the federal government space how to work on the, in that particular area. Civility still looks at Simplified Acquisitions, and we will always look at them because that's where a lot of training and conference uh, uh, right. con opportunities do come out, and we offer those services, right? Uh, but they're quick turnaround. Sometimes they're just two pagers, you know, RFQs, requests for quotes. Um, not a lot of technical knowledge necessary. Our first contract was me managing a, uh, a program management for the Army. They needed someone to find gyms in all of the uh, United States for uh, MEP stations, which is the individuals that are in recruiting stations throughout the country. They have to still work out because there's still a requirement of them in that uniform. So that was one of the very first contracts we got. And so that was fun. And uh, I used to work out a lot. So, of course, being connected to gyms was easy for me. I knew how to talk to those people. Mm -hmm. um, then I uh, also utilized the, the option of having a, a company that proclaimed that they were going to be my mentor um, and uh, brought on an 8 day opportunity to them. And then they sub um, some contract, some contracts and work to civility management solutions. Okay. And uh, that allowed me to also pick up a little bit more momentum. Uh, still though, uh, unfortunately that mentor chose to take more of the pie than he should have, but I am grateful that he didn't take it all because as you may already know, a lot of times the primes dismiss the subcontractor once they get the work. Right, uh, right, in right. my case, I did maintain a, a, a body for a very long time, uh, which was the admin person, the lowest right. person on the contract. Right. So I was still sitting at my kitchen table at 7.50 an hour. Uh, in other words, uh, he did not really uh, do anything he said right. he was going to do. He didn't move the needle, uh, just, so to speak. Yeah, he, he did. but I was getting past performance. Um, okay. So I, I was appreciative for what I did have. And I just kept moving instead of being angry at or disappointed. I was disappointed, but I wasn't angry to a point of letting that interfere me from what I needed to do. So I just stayed in the game and uh, continued to make some things happen. And uh, finally, when I obtained my 8A, when I say finally, I purposely waited because I just wasn't going to jump into it just because. And my strategy in the end was that once people started asking me, Eric, are you 8A yet, Lori? Right. I'm sorry? Yeah, once we, yeah, for yeah, Are you 8A yet? That's when, yeah, I called your name, so I apologize. That's when um, things actually took a shift because I obtained it. Uh, January of 2016, by March of 2016, 90 days, I was doing an oral presentation. And, and by May um, of 2016, we were awarded our first direct award of $2 million for two years. So now I was able to go ahead and get the infrastructure going. And um, this is now, you know, that four and a half year mark for civility to have actually have some real work uh, as a prime inside of uh, Department of Homeland Security. Now, can we go back? Because we didn't sure. put any dates to that. I don't think I mm -hmm. want people to to have a perspective on this. 2012, you stopped mm -hmm. working. You were paying yourself minimum wage up until 2015, 2016? Uh, actually, 2013, I stopped working. 2012, okay, 2013. I was established. Uh -huh. and, but 2013 uh, is when the contract ended. And I... Um, started working for civility management solutions right and uh, i missed one contract which was a very short contract but i went inside the va as a third tier sub uh and i was paying myself i think 25 dollars an hour so i was the actual person on the contract <laughs> in the 1099 staff yes that is um and that lasted for about nine months uh and then i would say by 2000 um 14 or so uh, that's when the simplified acquisition activity began with me learning how to do those and that they even existed, um, you know, and, and how much money is actually spent on them to say, this is the area I need to focus on as a new company to get my own relationships established, as well as being able to have some prime work. Um, and then I began to speak and go out and about and participate as a service disabled veteran at this point, uh, talking about the value of a veteran uh, to Fortune 500 companies. And I got paid to go out and do that work, which was commercial work. Uh, that again was just me, um, and then by um, now that's going on in 2014 and 2015. So 2016 is when the award came from the 8A, and so I am truly Civility Management Solutions is really an example of the value of the 8A program. Because right. let me say this to you, Eric, I served in this area before I started Civility. I managed 
up to 128 people, up to about 11.5 million for another company. And so I had relationships, right. but none of those relationships were, were profitable to me as a company owner now until I became the A day. Mm. That's when now they were able to get to me. It's not that I wasn't trying to compete. It wasn't like I didn't have teaming partners or everything, but as far as me as an individual being someone that they can say, I know I can trust you, Lori. I know you've done this. I know you will get it done, chick. Let's make this happen for you. That didn't happen until they were able to access me through the AA program. Right. But at that point, you had proven yourself. Yes, to, to many uh, right. uh, uh, that were just meeting me for the very first time now. Uh, but for the people that knew me even, like you said, they're skeptical, and rightfully so, because these are good government dollars, <laughs> taxpayer <laughs> dollars. And they try to make sure, you know, nothing happens bad to them in the process, right? And so it's understood of the uh, uh, precautionary me measures that they all take in this world. But I do know many other companies, uh, women-owned, that don't look anything like me, that within a year, they had like 50 subcontractors. I mean, you know, so right. no, it, no. It's, it is all about the relationships. Uh, but uh, it was a little bit of different effort on my end, uh, right. despite my relationships. Right. No, I understand. Now, I was reading somewhere where uh, you did an interview with SCORE, and it says mm -hmm. they helped you with your 8A application and a submission. How did that? Yeah. Uh, SCORE was attached to me at the very beginning, before I even uh, created the LLC of Civility Management Solutions, I was sitting with a SCORE mentor. He just happened to be a retired two-star general from the Army. So that was way cool to sit across from an Army general uh, that <laughs> was now talking to me about business. And he walked me through all the steps. I took notes. I did my part, came back, reported back to him, took more notes, did my part, came back, reported to him. And about the third or fourth time, he says, you know, one thing I like about you, Lori, that lets me know you're going to be successful. He says, every time we meet, you take notes. Every time you come back, you report what you've done. And I said, thank you, sir. Well, I didn't see any other way of getting it done, right? However, SCORE has been attached to civility since inception. And so I did that interview with him a couple of years later, uh, discussing the value of having a SCORE mentor. Um, and they're still attached to me. And so when I did the 8A program, um, filling all the paperwork out, they were my second pair of eyes. So I'd never I'd submitted anything to the SBA until after they reviewed it. And we had about three or four meetings and they reviewed everything. I made adjustments based on their recommendations or they signed off on stuff and said, this looks really good. And uh, when I had that complete uh, uh, package together, they say, Lori, I think you're ready. And I hit the button. So they can be utilized in ways that are beneficial and a, a huge learning curve for anybody that's getting into any type of business for that matter, but government contracting included. Uh, I think that's wonderful. I know there's so many people out here charging these um, these mm, fees that are yeah. astronomical to, for registration mm. certification. And I, when I read that, I had to put that out there. I just want to to highlight that. It's not necessary, yeah. No, because in right. the end, it's your story that you must tell. It's your information that you must give. Uh, and uh, you still have to pull all that stuff together. <laughs> Nobody... <laughs> They can do that for you. So no. in the end, you just need somebody to look at it and make sure you've pulled it all together well. Um, and, and that's where SCORE can come in handy. And they love to because they're there to volunteer their time to give back and their expertise. Well, one of the things that I was also reading is that your PTAC in D.C. holds trainings on federal proposals and marketing and record keeping. Mm -hmm. And everything else. Um, some of my, my, I met, you know, many people there that I can just spell out their names, you know, between Guy Timberlake, Gloria Lark. And Dan Sturdivant, individuals that supported DC's PTAC, it would come in and share with us the nuggets necessary on, from, from cradle to grave, basically, because the Procurement Technical Assistance Center's PTACs are focused on people that are interested in government contracting. Right. And may I add, they um, here in DC made a relationship in some sort with the VA regarding the veterans uh, certification process with CVE. And so that was brought to my attention at one of the PTAC sessions that I sat in on. So when I actually was doing my service disabled veteran small business certification with the VA, I utilized PTAC as nice. my reviewer. 
Nice, nice. You know, nice. so none of Love my it. certifications have gone forth initially. They're, they're now managed by me completely because I get it. But initially, I, I had the second pair of eyes of, uh, and their, you know, expertise to, to share with me to make sure that I wouldn't get denied. And I can honestly say I never got denied uh, for any of those. Now, that GSA schedule, that's another monster. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about we're it. We're, we're, we're going to stay off. <laughs> I don't yeah. even, but the certification process never been denied. I, those but, but, those but, processes were easy. But I can tell <laughs> you, Lori, that counseling. I mean, you're, you're talking about uh, $10,000 worth of value right there. Yeah, yeah. Thank That's you. what people are charging for, for saying that. Yeah, thank you for saying that because I have heard some some nightmare stories. And let me throw one other nugget on this 8A when I was saying, you know, I waited for people to start asking because way too many of us are getting it too fast. And I mean, three years, five years, six years have gone by and I've had people stand before me and say, you know, after a panel discussion, I've been 8A for this amount of time and uh, I don't have any work. And this was even before I became an 8 I'm like, well, who do you know in the federal government? I don't know anybody. I'm like, well, who told you to go get an 8 certification? So there's a lot of push, unfortunately, yes. coming throughout the country from right. some of these offices that are talking to small businesses, specifically, you know, the minority community. And I'm even going to lean in even more so with the African-American community. But that doesn't mean stuff is going to fall out the sky. No. Uh, you must have those relationships. And so I keep telling people whenever I meet them, if you haven't gotten your 8A, don't get it too soon because it, the, start, the clock starts ticking as soon as you get it. And those nine years will be up before you know it. And hence, Eric, now we don't have the wealth transfer. Thank you. Thank you, So it Lord. defeats the purpose. Thank you for that. I, by the way, um, let everybody know you weren't coached to say that. <laughs> no, no, that's, <laughs> that's, that's real talk. talk. That's, your, that's real talk. That's her experiences. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. I, cause I tell people, I tell people, I tell people, I get this question four times a week mm. and I get the comments, like you said, from the people who have the 8A, I got an email last night from someone, I have 8A mm. and they have no contracts. And I had some guy even said he wanted to give it back. <laughs> 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 and that's the worst part. You can't do any of that. You like, just he said, "Can gone. I put on pause? Can I stop?" It? <laughs> <laughs> no, none of the above. I and it, it is terrible because it's terrible. It's, it is. It, it's terrible because you know the whole whole point and the rationale behind why that was put together was based on the fact that they were trying to open up doors for I us know. that I, we can imagine, cannot get into. Can you imagine that? Yeah, and so when it's not utilized properly, we're, we're you know, squandering this opportunity. Yes, once in a lifetime, once a lifetime opportunity. We're squandering once in a lifetime opportunity. Right. Yes, sir. So tell me uh, about your time at the National Small Business Association, serving on the council. Um, it was a. a I'm still connected to them, um, okay. but I'm not as committed to that particular entity as I am Vet Force okay. and Women Impacting Public Policy. Nice. But all okay. three of them play in the same lane. Basically, they are the advocate arm, uh, making an uh, impact on the Hill of the things that needs to be shared with our congressmen and senators of what's important in the small business community. And um, that force specifically focuses in on veterans and what is the federal government doing in regards to opening up the doors for veterans, service disabled veterans to get opportunities, uh, not just at the VA, but throughout all of the federal government. Um, and unfortunately, it is a number that the SBA said at 3% that, you know, is nominal at most um, agencies other than the VA, the amount of, you know, veteran businesses that actually get work inside those agencies. Um, many people are challenged with that one, equal to the hub zone. Those are the two that typically fall short right. um, in this, in this um, outreach and getting government contracts to those business owners. And then on women impacting public policy, um, which I've sat on the board. Uh, I'm not just on the board. I, I'm, I'm not a board member. I've sat on the Hill through their advice of coming to me and saying, look, Laura, you are a woman. You're an 8A and you're a service disabled veteran. And, you know, all three of those things are important to us and they are, are applicable to some of the laws that we need to have addressed. And so I have witnessed now three times total uh, on the Hill on behalf of that community which makes me quite proud to do because uh, I am speaking for us all. all. Right. It's not about me only as a business owner. 
but to uh, see some of those changes actually being discussed and uh, several of them being considered. A few of them are already at the pretty much end of the line and we expect to see those things come out wow. uh, in the final uh, NDAA rulings um, as well as some adjustments you know, to the FAR. Um, so yes, I, I'm highly involved with that and it just kind of happened. Uh, you know, again, I'm the personality that people kind of look at me, and expect me to open my mouth and say something and I don't disappoint them because <laughs> I am the one that would go, excuse me. No, 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 no. Excuse me. <laughs> um, that's not true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's just, it, it's a natural flow. And so the, the becoming an advocate has become a, a real natural flow. And uh, VetForce, when I decided to become a part of their uh, committee, um, I said, I'll, you know, be part of this committee. I, I should join can my you, mentor. Can you tell us do it. Vet Force is Veteran Entrepreneurship Task oh, yeah. Force? That's correct. Thank you okay. very much for helping out with the, with the <laughs> acronyms. Um, they were very instrumental in getting the 3% ruling. Um, many Vietnam veterans are affiliated with this. There were no... Um, woman on the executive committee. There's another woman, Maureen, actually on the overall committee, but I'm an officer. And so at that time, I'm thinking, I didn't ask for a job. I just said, I want to be on the committee. What happened? They're like, oh, Lori, we nominated you and you've been elected. And I'm like, but I didn't, I didn't ask for this. So, <laughs> you know the, I mean? And, is that and, the interagency and, and, task force? Uh, that's the uh, veteran, yes, the veterans uh, task force. Okay, um, yeah. Right. That force. Right. Uh, so here I am now learning that I've been elected as the secretary before I even serve on the committee. I'm immediately going into an officer role. I said, oh, am I the secretary because I'm the woman out of the group? <laughs> you know, I had to I had to go in on that. Right. Right. You know, right. They're no, like, oh, Lori. Uh, no, that's not the case. I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. But, uh -huh. you know, the value of it and it was uh, uh, definitely God ordained. I have to acknowledge that because as the secretary of that force and being so new in the game, you know, just seven years as a whole, as of to date, my learning curve was, was huge because now I was forced to sit in on these meetings and mm. pay attention to every word that is being said because I'm recording it. And so I couldn't pick up my phone and play around like a lot of people are sitting in on meetings do. Right, right, right. <laughs> so the, it really helped me to really grow in this space of knowing where the problems have been, uh, what has been done to fix them, and some of the things that we need to do going forward. And it's honorable, too, because I am a lot of times the only woman in the room uh, with these guys that are Vietnam veterans uh, and some either people on the Hill uh, or SES levels within the federal government agencies to have some real one-on-one -on -one conversation about what they are doing on behalf of veterans throughout this country that's interested in doing federal government contracting. So it is wonderful to be present to know and share with them clearly that women are also veterans because sometimes people tend to forget that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Oh, I've had some, well, as you see in my, in my, some of my circle, people in my circle have been women on veterans that have had uh, yes, have. successful businesses. So I, I guess yes. I, you know, I spread the love. Um, I want and congratulations. Everyone... <laughs> no, I do <laughs> doing that. I do. I no. spread the love, and I and because I, I mean, I first of all, I like women entrepreneurs, but moreover, mm. I like the the stories because everyone's story is different, That's and true. people can identify um, with your story, what you look like, what you've gone through, and your experiences. And again, going back to uh, uh, Robert Smith, what he said was that a lot of times as minorities, we're playing defense before we ever get a chance to play offense. Mm. So, mm -hmm. And I heard you say mm -hmm. that in so many, in a different way, in so many words uh, early on, where you were saying that there are other people who came out that had some yeah. opportunities that you didn't have. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, yeah. for me, I think showcasing all walks of life, all types of people's experiences mm -hmm. will help mm -hmm. uh, reach a, a broader audience. And also may makes people aware that um, there are some still some obstacles and challenges that people are facing here that they may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. So that's one. And they just have to gird themselves up in the process and just go forth, you know, because right. if you've been anointed to do it, then, you know, you don't let anything prevent that from happening, no matter what race or what gender you may be. Right. Right. Um, and so I, I definitely want to be a voice behind that because there's uh, just recently I attended a conference and sexism was there, mm -hmm. hit me in the face. I mean, the guy was just outright 
Wow. I mean, outright saying things to me that was all about being in lingerie. I wonder what you look like when you're in uniform. You are fine. And, you, and, and I'm sitting no. there like trying to manage this at a table of six people and I'm the only woman there. And again, I was a Marine. I'm used to being around guys. I grew up in a household with brothers and a father. So I'm not intimidated by no man. That doesn't, that doesn't do me. Uh, and I'm grateful to be able to say that. I'm not intimidated by that. So finally, I had to find a four-letter word that I had lost some time ago in my life uh -huh. to use it against him to let him know, you will stop it. And so he heard me, I think, pretty loud and clear when I used the tone that I used to use in Marine Corps <laughs> and make it perfectly clear that this is unacceptable. And I'm not going to sit here and continue to try to be nice with you when you're sitting here, you're being very disrespectful. And I'm right. sitting in my president and CEO seat at a conference and you're right. sitting there as a government employee. This is not cool. Wow. Wow. No, that's, that's incredible. You're totally out of order. Wow. So yes, it, it does exist still, but we have to fight the fight and then also take a stand because I could have sat there eh, 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 all day long with him, you right. know, and he right. would have never got the point. And we, I just would have went to my room and, and possibly been the type of girl bawling in tears. Well, I'm just happy not to be her. So <laughs> we fixed it at the table. And I bet you he'll think twice about next time he come for me anyway. Sorry. Yeah, I think he's going to think twice next time we go to any. <laughs> I think he helped a lot of people out with that situation. Yes. You need to shut it down, boy. You know, you can be on the front page of the newspaper if you don't stop. No. I got money. You know, <laughs> you know what? I'm like, I like this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about wealth transfer, exactly. Okay, but I would think, come for me now. <laughs> I, would, I would think, especially in today's yeah. world, that they would be that would be less happening, right? You and would it's, think, it's yeah. But climate of all of the everything on TV, yeah. like. Yeah, it's it's very real. The, the the struggle is real. Uh the challenges are real. Um, but you know, if you're in it to win it, then you learn the mechanisms necessary to get you through those times and you bear through it. Now we talked mm -hmm. about uh, and oh, one other thing before we get off this the veteran uh, vet force thing. When you testified at a hearing, um, what mm -hmm. was that about? Um, uh the first time I was there, I was there uh on behalf of uh the support of veterans receiving training right. in entrepreneurship. Okay. And uh, shortly thereafter, dollars were allocated, additional dollars were allocated to support veterans trainings in entrepreneurship and in, in, in even in the area of government contracting. The Veterans Institute of Procurement, Barbara Ash runs that. She does an outstanding job on behalf of veterans. And her program allows you to be there for three days, I believe it is, you know, at the cost of the VIP program. You just have to get yourself there. But at, initially, uh, when I went through the program, it was just uh, VIP grow, which was meaning you needed to have like two or three employees, you need to have some revenue, you need to have some things in place. Now as they have a VIP start for someone that just got out of the military today can actually register for that VIP start and learn what it is to be in the government contracting space. Then grow is still there and she also has VIP international um, where, you know, uh, um, exporting uh, uh, things of that nature. So those are offerings to veterans and veteran business owners, along with many others that are out there, the V-Box, they were all funded on another level after me and a few other people sat and expressed, you know, how we clearly would have appreciated having this option when we got out. Um, and not to mention just the option of what to do with the GI Bill. Everybody doesn't want to go to college when they're 45, 50 years old. No, when they've, you know, retired from the military, you know, yeah, that's, that's what but yet they may want to use, yeah, they may want to go into entrepreneurship, right. allow them to utilize that funding to maybe start their franchise and things of that nature. So all of those things were discussed at that one. And the second two were um, basically the same. It was about what are you doing to support uh, some uh, um, increase in attention for women and for veteran and uh, the 8A program, as well as they had a gentleman there talking from the hub zone aspects of the things that are needing, act, you know, lack of access to capital was, of course, a big deal for women. Uh, contract access is a big deal for the veteran community. Um, and then 
as far as supporting the 8A program and the value of it and why it makes a difference and why it needs to stay and, and never be, you know, removed from the SBA's small business programs. Those are all kind of a lump sum, you know, without any specific targets of what our intention was to make sure that they knew that we're still having some matters here that we need to deal with. And so um, changing even the uh, three-year average to a five-year uh, average of receipts is, is one of the things that was thrown on the table at that time. I think that just um, came out today. They it, approved that. Exactly. Exactly. So hence some of the things have okay. actually moved uh, since then. But yeah. And that's, that's outstanding. And so both, one was the house and one was the Senate. And uh, I, I think it was the Senate first actually. And amazingly the call came into my office from the house asking me would I like to come over and sit on their panel uh, and witness on the same subject uh, to their members and my answer was yes and so I went over and within 30 days I'm like doing this back to back and so I've, I teased my team I said when the president gonna call because I mean I got something to tell them too <laughs> so everybody want to hear what I gotta say <laughs> when did you do this what year was that <laughs> oh that was that was this year um the okay. um the oh, so initial recent. one for the training yeah the one for training was over two years ago okay. but this year uh, uh, yeah, it can be pulled up in the system. Uh, you know, they got it out there for us all to review. Okay. Uh, this year, uh, this summer, I, I, it was the Senate in the House uh, that they were discussing the relevance of the SBA programs. And we were there, me and two others, to validate the need of these programs and, and the things that are still needed to make them even better. Okay. A couple of questions. Are you a morning person or a night person? Uh I would have to say more night. I mean, um, I allow my body to wake myself up in the morning, even though six o'clock is a normal wake up time for me in prayer. Then I go into my praise and worship and I work out uh, all before I leave home. And um, when I hit my day, I'm, I, I'm now powered up and I'm ready to go. And most cases, though, I don't end my day till about 1130 or midnight. Uh, and I'm single. Uh, so being a single woman means I try to get some personal time in, if some phone calls and things like that, you know, uh, and to, so I can be engaged right. uh, with the personal side of my life. So I have some balance. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's my day, 6 to 6 a.m. till about midnight. That, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty much how I roll. Yeah, no, I, you, you, you're a morning and night person. Because I think yeah. 6 a.m., no one would say that's a, uh, a night person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I'm guaranteed more to be up late than I am at getting up early. Okay. Uh, uh, because uh, there are days when my body says, no, not now, I listen to it. Um, you, so I'm a baby boomer, so I'm, I'm doing really well as, as a baby boomer. No one thinks I'm a baby boomer, but I am. Uh, and part of that is because of the way I choose to live my life by practicing certain things right. to uh, maintain my health. No, that's, I was going to ask that. Do you have a, a meditation or yoga? Uh, but you said you, you exercise each day. Yeah, mm -hmm. exercise. And it includes all of those things, uh, you know, um, meditation, prayer, um, praise and worship, you know, all of those things are important to me to make sure I stay balanced in general. I mean, I don't, uh, the stresses are going to come in life, whether you're a business owner or not. Um, the risk are there. And it's not just the risk of being a business owner. This is you know, been my most recent thing because I've gone through a very, very difficult time with a divorce, but it wasn't difficult now that I'm on the other side of it because I fought the fight and I won. So it's okay. But it was, it was quite challenging based on the things uh, and the attack of what was trying to be done, uh, which was destroy me and the company and I had to fight to win it. But I can tell you if I didn't have those kind of things in place and practicing those things, then I probably would have been a little more doomed. You know, no, no, but, no. I, agree. Uh, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I was practicing good habits prior. And so, of course, I continue those habits still today. Uh, what are some of the common mistakes that you see repeatedly from small business firms that are getting started? Uh, a day too soon. That's a, I'm going to have to go there because it's just a real fact. Um, it's just heartbreaking. Um, not taking out the time to get trained up mentally for what it is that they're trying to do, despite your subject matter expertise. Whereas, for example, Civility Management Solutions didn't come to the table because Lori had a subject matter expertise of technology or finance or conference. No, I just knew people. That was their subject matter expertise, and they're now part of my team. Um, 
civility is based solely off of me being an entrepreneur that has great leadership, uh, great personable skills. Um, and because of that, people have, you know, agreed to join my vision. Um, so training was important. And I spent a lot of time with PTAC and SCORE and every other method, you know, that, that Count was me available. In. Goldman Sachs. Yeah, count, yeah, thank you. You know them all. <laughs> I got you. Thank you for naming them all. <laughs> I and I, I, recently, I recently did ADA Accelerator, and I just ended with the VA. They, yeah. they have a vet biz lady. I, and I'm, I'm like a, part of the first core heart something. I don't know. I was the first in all those areas. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, first no, in First and 8A accelerated program that uh, they would like to do nationally, but they're doing it here as a pilot. And then now the vet business lady. So yeah, I've, and, and so I will always know that, I always know that training is important. And being a Marine, you know, training, training, training. Best, we're not the best in the world for any other reason other than the fact that we've been trained up so well that it's natural for us to do what we do. And so I, I take that same way of being into my civilian life, and especially as an entrepreneur, that I must continue to seek out training and, and get understanding. And I think a lot of people lack in doing that because they just want to go out there and get that money in their mindset. You know, I right. just want to be a business owner. Right, and, right. and also, let me throw this out there. Please understand, business owners, that you always have a boss. It's called your clients. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> you right. Know, if you want to, man, I just want to work for myself. I be my, no, no, no. You always no. got somebody that's going to direct what you do. Yeah. Uh, um, no matter how big you may get, you know. And so there's some revelation to that. And then the other part, risk is not the biggest risk in starting a business. The biggest risk for all people, business owners or not, are relationships. Um, because I've now lived long enough and I've had some interesting experiences to realize, you know, the relationships you have with people, they can be one way today and then they can be totally different tomorrow. And managing that so that it doesn't affect your life, especially, you know, negatively, is, is hugely important. Um, because relationships are necessary to survive. Tell us one truth that you wish you knew when you first got started in business. One truth. That you knew when you first got started. <laughs> that there were a lot of uh, individuals in this business of government contracting that does not operate in high integrity or high ethics. I've been really shocked and surprised to know how many people are taking advantage of others. Tell us one myth that you had before getting started that you'd like to dispel before we close out. That is difficult. Okay. I, would, I would like to, yeah, it's not difficult. If it's what you want to do, if it's what you choose to do, then just make it happen. You know, all the rules and regulations are being attached to the federal government. A lot of people whine about them. And right. I'm like, well, you're in the wrong business if you're whining because <laughs> that's not acceptable. Um, and basically, it's a process and it's a procedure. And once you learn it, it's actually quite easy. It's interesting you say that. I feel the same way. I said I actually prefer working with the federal government because they are structured. Yes. When you're out here in the private sector, it's the wild, wild west. They may tell you something. <laughs> it might be on paper, but that's not really what they want you to do. It yeah. might be in your contract, but they want you to do something else. And you're like, wait, yes. so my contract says this. They go, yeah. that doesn't matter. That's just, that's for the office. Now, hey, in the field, this is what you, it's what you really want you to do. So exactly. I like the structure. I like the fact that it's 200 pages because it's like, okay, so if I do everything in here, I'm, I'm good? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anything outside of there, y'all going to pay me for. Exactly. And, and, and you, you, you just simplified it. And that's, that's really the truth. Uh, uh, you know, uh, getting the work is the most challenging part, probably. But, you know, once you really learn the ropes of what federal government contracting is all about, you know, it's, it's a hard job. But it really is a simple process once you learn how to, you know, follow the direction that the government gives you. Okay. Now, before you know? we close out, and this is actually yes. unique to you. I have your tip from 2014. Oh my goodness. Okay. I want to read it to you. And then you tell me how you feel about that today. Actually, okay. it's approaching 2020, five years later. So it says, as a startup in the business of contracting, I've learned that there is power in networking, being present in the agency outreach sessions, industry days, 
Women-owned sessions and being a member of WIP is mandatory if you want to show successful business owners that you are serious about being in the game. This opens up the door for subcontract opportunities, which will get you in the past performance to stay in the game. I will not change a word. Look at that. Because no matter how large or how small you're going to be in this side of the house, those things are applicable. And I do have every anticipation of being a mid-tier size firm. Wow. Wow. And everything that's there means that's what I need to do to get there. Wow. Any final parting words for the audience today? Make it happen, Captain. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Hey, listen, look, thank you so much for coming on today. I really enjoyed this episode with you. Oh, I enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for giving me a moment to share my story and give me some great memories. No, no, thank you. Thank you. No, so am I. I am as well. (laughs) Thank you so much. Talk to you Mm -hmm. soon. All right. Have a great day. Thanks. See ya. Hello, fellow giants. Before you go, I want to leave you with a quick programming note. Again, if you or anyone you know is a programmer, developer, inventor, telecommunications expert, reach out to us. All of the solutions are not IT related. Some are as simple as improving lighting systems in planes, HR solutions, reducing application wait times, or building temporary bathrooms in odd places. The needs are vast, and my goal is to try and bring on as many people into the space this year as humanly possible. If you know someone or you are that someone, definitely send him or her our way. We want to hear from everyone who believes that they have an innovative solution to a pressing problem. Thanks again for listening to this episode. As always, the show notes and all recommendations will be posted on our website at govcongiants.com forward slash podcast. Mm -hmm.